I recently did another one of my millennial money meetups here in Toronto and it was awesome because it's actually in November which is financial literacy month in Canada uh, it was super fun it was kind of the same format as the one I did in Vancouver smaller about 40 to 50 people held in a restaurant downtown and it was super super fun and I was also joined by Lisa Zamparo who is my special guest she is a financial strategist and lifestyle optimist which I love I love that title I want to I want to be a lifestyle optimist um, and she was my special guest and we talked about debt and credit because well we're just heading into the holidays and this is kind of a time where lots of people spend a lot of money a lot of money on their credit card that they don't have so we really want to kind of answer people's questions and talk about how to be responsible with credit now this event would not have been possible without the support of Manu Life Bank they were this event's sponsor and I'm so glad they were because they fit in really great with this event because they just came out with a survey that talks about uh, Canadians and their credit use so it was really great to kind of share some of those stats with uh, everybody who attended so we could all learn a little bit more and of course I'm going to include a link in the description so you can take a look too to learn a little bit more about yourself now if you weren't able to attend live or maybe you did but you want to watch it again and see what we talked about I am going to share with you right now the live recording of me and Lisa and I hope you enjoy it all right looks like everyone's got a place uh, well, welcome to the Millennial Money Meetup. My name is Jessica Morris. So if I haven't said hello yet, I'll try my best to find you, or you can find me uh, after our presentation. Um, but this is the fourth Millennial Money Meetup that I have put on, the third one I've done in Toronto, and actually the second one I have uh, done in this format. So uh, I founded the Millennial Money Meetup in September 2016 as a way to kind of bring the conversation of money, personal finance, offline. Um, I am a blogger. I have a podcast, a YouTube channel. I'm online all day long, but I love being able to talk to people in real life about all these things and uh, talking to new people. So there's lots of cool people who have no idea who I am who are here, and that is the best thing ever. I love that. So uh, I'm so, so happy that you all decided to take your Tuesday night off to be with me and uh, hopefully mix and mingle with some really cool people. Um, but first, before I kind of get to the main event and introduce my my special guest for this meetup. Uh, there's a few special words I know uh, our sponsor, Manulife Bank, would like to share. And uh, a big thank you to Manulife for sponsoring this Millennial Money Meetup. I'll keep it short. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out. I hope everyone enjoyed all the food. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for um, organizing this. And really, uh, this is all about just getting the conversation started about debt management and not being so embarrassed. We had a really cool, uh, I don't know if it's really cool, but <laughs> I think it's really cool, a debt survey recently from Manulife Bank. Um, and really, we're just, we want Canadians to really start talking and don't be embarrassed to talk about debt. So looking forward for the chat between uh, Lisa and Jessica, and I'll uh, let you guys get started. Thank you. All right. It's not easy getting into these seats and heels and a dress. Um, okay, so I want to introduce my lovely guest, the special guest for this evening, Lisa Zamparo. So she's a chartered professional accountant a financial strategist. She's the founder of The Wealth Company, spelled W-E-L-L-T-H. Uh, and her mission is to help others reach their financial goals by aligning their spending with their priorities. And you can find out more information about her at lisazamparo.com. Thank you so much for being my guest for the evening. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm really excited to have this conversation with the group. You are, I'm just, I'm super stoked. Because, so I, backstory, how I know Lisa. Yeah. How did we meet, actually? That's a good question. I feel like, did I find you or did you find me? I found you. Oh, you did? <laughs> oh. We met uh, just over a year ago at FinCon. Uh, we were oh my the, gosh, the two Canadians right. who were there. Two Canadians found each other in San Diego, of all places. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I recognized you from your blog, and I thought, there's another Canadian. I must talk to her. Yeah, we need to be friends because yeah. we Canadians do stick together. <laughs> and we just ended up at the right place at the right time, and totally. here we are today. Yeah, and when she told me she is in Toronto, she's a financial strategist and a lifestyle optimist, which I love. I want to be that. That sounds lovely. <laughs> That's my made-up job title. Yeah, I love it. I want to be a lifestyle optimist. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're going to 
be fast friends. And yeah, I've been following her ever since. And I knew she would be the perfect uh, guest to talk about today's theme, which is about debt and credit, how to use it responsibly and how to also just not be embarrassed to talk about it because we've all dealt with it in one way or another. Um, and also it just seemed fitting for you know, a couple of reasons. November, if you don't know, is Financial Literacy Month in Canada. And it is also, well, the holiday season. So this is kind of the time where people spend a lot on their credit cards and then regret it in January when they have to pay them. So this is kind of a good time to talk about debt and credit so we don't make some mistakes in December. Um, so before I kind of, uh, we kind of jump into our conversation, and of course we will have a Q&A at the end, so if you have some specific questions, we will be here to answer them. Uh, I wanted to actually kind of talk about uh, Manulife Bank's, uh, you know, fall 2017 fall debt survey. So I thought it was actually really interesting. So they did this really cool survey. Yeah, I know, I'm the, probably the only other person that thinks this survey is cool, <laughs> but whatever. Um, it really had some really interesting stats in it. So I just want to share some with you so to kind of get your mind thinking about debt in Canada. So they found that less than one third of debt Holders have achieved their debt reduction goals in one year. Canadians who work with financial advisors are 60% more likely to be satisfied with their financial health, which makes a lot of sense. Oh, and that's where the cards go. Oh, damn. Oh, apologies. All right, so uh, nearly one third of debt holders are embarrassed or don't know who to talk to about debt management. 71% of uh, those debt holders would like to be more confident about financial decisions. 55% said that they seldom discuss their debt situation with friends or family. Only 10% say creating a financial plan is a priority in the next five years. So some crazy stats there. Um, just so I know where I'm at. Oh. I've got a few more. 62% <laughs> of Canadians are not satisfied with their overall financial health or access to money for emergencies. That's a really high and scary. 53% uh, of Canadians believe financial challenges take a toll on their mental or emotional health, and 34% say that of their physical health. So that's kind of disconcerting. <laughs> um, and okay, and before I go on, I just had this uh, quote that I actually kind of uh, really liked. It's from Rick Lunny. He's the pre president and CEO of Manulife. So he says, there's a very strong connection between health and wealth, which I think is also a real connection between us because we're all about, you know, financial health, physical health, mental health. They all kind of play a part together. People should feel confident they have allies when it comes to managing and reducing their debt. Beginning uh, to talk about debt, especially with a financial advisor, is a very important first step. Canadians who do not have a financial advisor are encouraged to seek out somebody they can trust. So just the idea that um, people have debt and you shouldn't be ashamed of it. You shouldn't feel like you can't talk about it and you shouldn't feel like you can't reach out for help because if you're in the situation, it doesn't mean that you have to figure out how to get yourself out of it. There's nothing wrong with asking for some help to figure out how to get out of it. All right. So with that being said... I thought actually we can start talking about, <laughs> I thought this would be a good conversation starter. I hope Lisa, you agree. <laughs> uh oh. Um, uh -oh. Um, because when we were kind of talking about what are we going to talk about at this event and we started kind of spitballing and wrote notes, uh, I thought it would be fun to kind of kick this off by proving that we're also not perfect and we also make money mistakes. I think I know where this is going. Yeah, you know where this is going. Um, and we've all dealt with debt and credit in our own ways. Uh, we made mistakes, but we've, of course, learned from them. So, Lisa, what would you say would be kind of one of your biggest mistakes when it comes to debt and credit use? Well, my biggest, most embarrassing one happened right out of university. So I went to McMaster to study accounting, uh, and I took a gap year between university and joining Ernst & Young to become a CPA. Um, in my gap year, I decided to travel, so I went over to the UK. Um, and while I was there, I had a student loan, right, from my student days. But it, it wasn't an OSAP loan. It was a student line of credit with TD right. Bank. Mm -hmm. And while I was at school, I didn't have to make any payments on it. But what I didn't know was that when you graduate, 
you have to start paying it back. (laughs) So I was out of the country for almost a year and I didn't realize that the bank had been trying to get a hold of me all of that time to find out why I hadn't made a payment on my student line of credit. Uh, And the way I found out was I was about to get on a flight to meet my girlfriend in Greece for a little trip and my bank account was frozen and I couldn't access my money and I called my mom in a panic. (laughs) As you do. (laughs) And she you know, told me the truth about what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I think it's, I, I've never actually shared that story publicly before. Jessica was the first first. person, (laughs) was the first person I told. I don't even know if I told my husband that story. He knows now. (laughs) Now the whole world knows. But I'm not ashamed to say it because I think it's important as a CPA to acknowledge that like, we're not taught this stuff. No. Like we don't know it inherently. Um, so if I can make that mistake and go on to become a financial planner, uh, like you guys are going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. There's hope for us all. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess since you shared, I have to share. I don't. Okay. So I, I've made some mistakes. I've actually made one recently. So this is like real talk for you guys. <laughs> I recently, uh, I've been traveling a lot recently And I'm always pretty good with paying off my credit cards right on time. Uh, But sometimes when you're traveling a lot, you kind of lose track of time and you lose track of, wait, when is that date that credit card bill is due? And so two of my credit cards, oh, this is so embarrassing. Two of my credit cards, I actually, it was a week late in paying down what I owed. And yeah, I got dinged a lot. You know, not a lot, but in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, what an idiot move for, for getting to pay my credit cards. I just forgot what week it was. And so there you go. There you go, yep. guys. I'm not perfect. <laughs> Jessica, did you call the bank to apologize? Uh, no. Can you do that? Because I actually have Can done this before. Do I have also been late on my credit card bill. And if you have a really good history of paying, I do. I've had <gasps> them reverse the interest charges for me. Now I've also asked I just one like that. I deserve that. I deserve that. Yeah, but Call, call. Oh my God, I'm going to call call them tomorrow. (laughs) Like, hey, hey, so here's the thing. (laughs) For sure, for sure. I mean, it'll probably only work once or twice. I don't think, well, I didn't know that was a thing, so I don't think I've ever called them. I mean, maybe I have once, but that was probably like a while ago. Okay, I'm going to try that and I'm going to get back to you all on what they they say. It might just be like tough luck, kid. But (laughs) it might be tough times now uh, compared (laughs) to when I was asking this question, but. Yeah. You never know. It doesn't hurt to ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. Oh my gosh. I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, so I thought maybe we can talk about credit cards a little bit more in depth. Just that since, sounds good. You know, I, I feel like, you know, when I talk to people, credit cards are kind of, they can be good because, you know, it, it gives you access to things. It makes, you know, buying things online really easy. Um, and you also can get rewards and points and those are lovely. But there's also kind of a bad side to them if you don't use them responsibly. So uh, I guess I'd like to know from your point of view, what are some things that people really need to focus on in terms of like using credit cards responsibly? What does that mean in general? I have a mantra, which is don't, it's not just like spend less than you earn, but it's really spend what you have, right? And I think the danger with credit cards is that you can very easily spend more than the money you actually have in your bank account. So a nice rule of thumb or a way to sort of keep a a guideline or keep your credit spending in check is to make sure that you never put more on your credit card than you have in cash in the bank. And I think that's kind of a nice safety net that can help you make sure that you're not going to get into trouble with your credit cards. So one of the things that I actually had in some of those buckets, and I'm not sure if all of you knew that those buckets were, they had some money questions in there because I want to get the money conversation started. So I'm going to challenge you at the end of this to do that and get into a group and just do one. They're not scary. But one of the questions was, how many credit cards do you have? Very simple question. But again, how many people have you asked that question to and answered? How Can many we credit pull cards? the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's pull. How, how many credit cards do we have? Oh, we yeah. Have? Oh, should we pull the audience? That's yeah. a great idea. Okay. Okay, okay so I'm going to start with uh, one. Raise your hand. Two, three, four. I don't know. I might Ooh. be five, actually. <laughs> Amazing. I know. Okay. Here's, and I'll tell you, you know, uh, what 
my credit card situation looks like. So I've got uh, a cr- one credit card I've had for like 12 years. It was the first credit card I ever got. And as you kind of know, it's very important to keep your oldest credit card. It has your uh, longest credit card history or credit history on there. So very important, especially if you've been very good at uh, paying down your credit uh, card regularly and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to keep that probably until the day I die because I'm afraid to kill it. Um, And then I have one that is for my individual personal use, Uh, one that is a joint credit card with my husband, and one that I just dedicate for business expenses. Is there another one? No, I think I just have four. (laughs) So that's me. What what do yours look like? Uh, I hesitated because I have one for personal, one for business. And then at three, I was like, wait, do I? Because I have the original credit card that I got as a student that my parents helped me Mm -hmm. sign up for before I went to school. But I actually cut up that credit card, so I don't have the physical card. Does it still exist? Like, did you just cut it up? Yeah, I cut it up, but it still shows up in my online banking. Mm -hmm. And I got a $10 credit for switching to uh, e-statements. So yeah. I now have oh, a $10 nice. like negative balance on that credit card. <laughs> and I don't know how to get that money. You should ask them for a new card. That's what you should do. I guess. But, you know, I've got my two and they're working for me. This business and personal. So I'm happy. So it actually is a... a- Great segue. Oh, well, not really segue. Just a fun fact. Uh, some people get confused. They think that, you know, like in the movies, people are like, ah, I'm done with this credit card. Chop, chop, chop. That does nothing. That just means that just means you don't have a credit card in your wallet. It still exists. If you want to cancel your credit card, you actually have to call the credit card company to cancel it. Yeah. Just so you know, if you didn't already, and that's okay if you didn't, that's okay. But I think... Maybe we should talk about the merits of canceling or not canceling a credit card because I have a lot of clients who don't know how a credit score works. And one of the factors is how much um, how much credit are you using of your total available credit? Mm -hmm. So if you cancel a credit card, you're actually lowering the total amount of credit you have access to and therefore Mm -hmm. increasing your usage rate. And it can Mm -hmm. actually have a negative effect. Yes. So I think, yeah, that's another, that's a really great thing. I think a lot of people don't know. Lots of misconceptions and we'll get into like credit scores and what the heck that means. Sorry, I jumped the gun. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm so excited to talk about credit scores. I love that. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so in case you don't know, so uh, say you have like two credit cards, they both have like $5,000 as their limit. Uh, That means you have access to $10,000 in credit. If you, uh, Basically, you want to basically only use 30% of your overall limit. Uh, That is good. If you use more, it kind of indicates to those credit bureaus that um, you might be kind of overextending yourself. So if you close one of those accounts, then it'll raise the, you know, percentage of, you know, you're going to be over that 30%. So just kind of keep that in mind, which is why I think a lot of people probably have one or more credit cards. Yeah, that's why I still have mine. Yeah. That one with no actual card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, quick question too. How do you now look for credit cards? So I, for me, I usually just would go to the bank and I'm like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. But there's so many out there. Do you do like research or like, do you have a game plan? I know there's so many people out there. I did a podcast episode recently about, you know, points, reward systems, things to look at. Um, is this something that like, are you one of those people that like are all about the points and stuff? I am all about the points, but I haven't done a crazy amount of research. I kind of fell into a pretty good deal. Okay. That's always good. Yeah. I mean, if it's good, it's good. I have one credit card that gives cash back and it's a small amount, but I kind of like seeing like, yeah, you're like getting the cash back. Yeah. I like seeing, (laughs) you know, 50 bucks taken off my bill. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Mm -hmm. feels really good, but I also have a travel reward one because I love to travel and Mm -hmm. actually getting a new credit card. Uh, for my business, I got access to a whole bunch of points as like a signing bonus, and that paid for my flight to FinCon where I met you. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Here's another question: Do you share a credit card with your husband? I do. Our personal credit card is joint. Yeah. My business credit card is just for me. Hmm. Hmm. Uh-huh. So, do you ever get in any? I mean, that's the kind of thing, you know, when you share a credit card with somebody, <laughs> you get to see what they spend. <laughs> get to have a conversation about that. Have you like? How do you deal with that? Um. I <laughs> have a few rules or guidelines that we like operate our relationship mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And one of them is that we can both spend a hundred dollars without having to tell the other person that that's sort of the petty cash limit of, of on your like joint credit card. Yeah. Or so even it's like just you see it, but you don't have to yeah. have an explanation. Exactly. If he spends under a hundred bucks, it's like, you know what? You're an adult. Go like for it. Like per month or? No, 
a transaction that's under 100. Now, if I mean, like, if he was doing what if he does like 10? Yeah, what if he does a lot of those? But like, in in general, I don't, I haven't noticed him doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, If we're going to spend more than 100, we'll usually like run it by the other person or say, hey, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm planning to go do this shopping just so you know that you're going to see it there. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think. I don't know. I guess I feel lucky that him and I just have really similar values in terms of what we want to spend on and how we want to spend. Mm-hmm. Um, like our, our habits, they're just very much aligned. So it's really never been a problem for us. That's and good. I kind of feel like a jerk saying that. Because like, yeah. I know it can be such a <laughs> sticking so point in a lot of relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. No, I think that's kind of what me and Josh, my husband's over there. He doesn't like me uh, pointing out, but he's over there. (laughs) Um, He's checking your credit card statement online. Yeah, I know. He's like, oh, shoot, what did I just spend the money on? I always feel like, well, you know what? We're pretty, you know, similar. Like, we're pretty transparent with our spending, and I always advocate for that. If you are in a relationship, if you share a credit card, or even if you don't, very important just to talk about it. Got kind of financially naked with your partner a little bit because uh, you get on the same page and it's just it's just easier, believe me. We don't, we rarely talk about, uh, or not rarely talk about, sorry. We rarely argue about money because we talk about it so much. Though I'm sure I'm the one that's you know loves doing that. And he's just there because I'm telling him to. <laughs> but it's, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I remember that first getting financially naked conversation. Yeah. That was really uncomfortable. It's scary. It is. It's like so scary. <laughs> and you're like, please don't leave me. <laughs> um, okay, let's shift gears a little bit because I know okay. a, a big uh, thing with a lot of us in the room is probably dealing with student debt, student loans. How many have had a student loan or currently has one that they're paying off. It's a lot. Oh, there's more, a lot of people. <laughs> I'd say a good, like 80% of the room almost. Um, have you, yeah, and you mentioned that you did have, did you have a student loan or just that student line I of credit? I had a student line of credit. So you never had a student loan? No. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Good for, like, yeah. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, good for you. Thanks, mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. Um, I had a student loan, though I, uh, it was very small. So it was like $5,000 and I only got it my last year of school. So lucky. Um, I got to live at home with my parents and I got to work. So I had money to spend on tuition. Uh, but still I had no idea what I was getting myself into with a student loan. Uh, I did know like inherently just from, I think from my parents that debt was bad. I knew that. So I just kind of, okay, I'm going to remember that. And so when I applied for a student loan, um, I think they did offer me way more than $5,000, but I'm like, no, I think I I only need $5,000. That's all I need for my last year. Um, and that I was good. But after that, I actually had no idea. I'm like, wait, how do I like pay it back? And like, when do they need it? (laughs) I had no idea. Um, so I kind of want to talk about, uh, since a lot of people do have student debt, and it's become kind of normal, um, a lot of people have it, they think everyone else has it, so what's the point of like trying to aggressively pay it down? Um, like, what are your kind of thoughts on, you know, I guess, you know, making that your kind of first priority when you finish school? Yeah. We talked about this before, about the idea of good debt and bad debt, right? And typically yeah. bad debt is debt that's like really high interest or that was um, because it's consumer debt, right? Mm-hmm. So you might think of student loans potentially could be good debt because it's a, a debt that you've taken on to further your education and hopefully you're going to earn more money in the future because of that debt. So it's going to end up paying you back. Um, but that being said, if having debt makes you feel bad, then yeah. that's bad debt to me. Yeah. So I think I would base my decision on like how aggressively to pay down the debt, partly by the interest rate and the math, but mm-hmm. more than that, understanding mm-hmm. how it makes me feel. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you're doing something that's going to make you feel good, right? Like if paying down debt really fast is going to motivate you, mm-hmm. um, then absolutely you should go for that. But mm-hmm. on the flip side, if paying more than you have to when it's super low interest... Um, if that's going to make you feel like you're not out there living your life and you're miserable because of it, mm-hmm. well, I don't think that's worth it either. Yeah. So there's no like right or wrong answer. Um, but I do think it's really important to know the numbers of it and know exactly how much interest it's costing you. And it's not enough to just say, well, it's 2%, because what does that really yeah. mean? Calculate it at the dollar level and yeah. understand how much in dollar terms is this going to cost me with my different payoff decision Mm -hmm. or my payoff dates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And from there, you can make the decision about what feels right. And I think the math can feel complicated, but there's a lot of online calculators that you can use. 
Yeah. Um, and I think with a little determination and like maybe like a study group to get mm-hmm. a group of friends together to figure out your own debt-free date. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think that's really key is you mentioned a couple of great things. So first, really knowing how much you owe. I think a lot of us were like, oh, I have an idea. No, like regularly check your, uh, you know, whatever student loan government account or whatever to see how much you owe. And also it, it will give you, you know, this is how much uh, time it'll take you to pay off at your current, uh, you know, payment schedule. Take a look at that and see like, huh, that's going to take me 20 years. And also calculate how much interest on top of what I'm paying back because it could be a lot of money. Um, So definitely, yeah, highly recommend looking at some calculators to see if like, if I add just $50 extra per month, will that take a year off or two years off? Um, So I actually wanted to, this is actually a really good segue because one of the things I had on my cards I really wanted to talk about was there's two kind of, uh, there's lots of different pay, uh, debt payoff strategies, but there's two pretty common ones. And I remember you and me when we're discussing, oh, what should we talk about? Uh, there's two that I definitely want to talk about. So one's called the debt snowball. Does anyone know when that one's, I heard like a couple of people. Uh, so if you don't know, that's okay. It's called, it's basically called that because you start with the smallest debt first and then you kill that one and then you go to the next biggest, the next biggest, so kind of like a big snowball. The next one's called debt avalanche or debt stacking. And that's where you get the high, you pay off the highest interest uh, debt first and then you kind of go from there. So the second lowest, or second highest and so and so forth. Uh, Usually in lots of financial books, they kind of, I think, preface like debt avalanche, that's a good strategy because you will overall be paying you know, quite a bit of money uh, if you don't focus on that high, high interest. But there's something to be said for kind of both methods. And you kind of touched on that a little bit. It's, it's how you feel and the emotion. I've talked to a lot of people who've uh, paid off debt in different ways. And sometimes it's just about like, what's the one that really bugs you the most? I'm going to attack that one because I just can't stand it. And sometimes that is your credit card. Or sometimes it's just like a it could just be like an IOU from your parents and you said you'd pay it back and they're like, I just want 1% interest. So it could be like your smallest debt. Um, so I would love to know your thoughts on both of those debt strategies. Well, I, I feel like you've covered it. Like that's <laughs> I know, exactly... I know. That's okay. But do you, do you like, in your, uh, I guess, opinion, like, do you think one works better than the other? Well, again, it comes back to like the, the logical brain math centered answer of what's working and then the more heart based um, emotional behavioral one of what's working. So I think the avalanche from a financial perspective probably gets you in the best place because Mm -hmm. you're going to pay the least amount of interest. Sure. So the question was, what do you think about, say, you were to go to the brick and they have some sort of a payment plan on if you want to buy furniture, is this good or is this bad? What are your instincts on this? You know, my instinct is to say don't do it because if you can't afford it today, you likely will not be in a financial position to afford it later. And especially when it comes to furniture and electronics, are you really going to want to have to pay the bill for a couch that you've already been using for a year in that time in the future, right? Like that's going to be so unmotivating. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think... Like, okay, again, the example of the financial versus the heart-centered answer, that might make sense because it's zero interest. And so some people say, you know, like, put off any payments as far into the future as possible because of compounding interest. You could invest that and blah, blah, blah. Sure, maybe you could get yourself better off, but it's probably not going to feel good. Um, Because from a, like... A behavioral perspective, we feel happier, studies have shown this, that we feel happier when we prepay for things, Mm -hmm. right? So, and we feel less happy and satisfied with our purchase when we wait to pay after, right? Mm -hmm. So think about like going on vacation, even using the credit card. It's the same kind of example where you swipe the card, you get the thing, then the buyers, like that excitement of buying kind of disappears. And then at the end of the month, you have to pay the bill and you feel stressed. Imagine if you prepaid for it and then just got to enjoy it free and clear. Then it feels like, and your furniture, your trip is Mm -hmm. free. Yeah. So in general, I'm going to say don't do it because you're probably not going to be happy about it, even if you're financially better off for it. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm just a bit, if we're talking furniture here, like, Craigslist and Kijiji are awesome. I just, I, I don't know. I just feel like that is one thing that is, those assets are depreciate in value yeah. the minute you buy them. So That's that con- consumer debt. Exactly. You want to avoid that. Yeah, avoid that at all costs if you can. Yes. So 
Okay, so the question was, what do you find is the biggest mistake millennials are making with their money? Do you want to start on that one? Oh my gosh. Hmm. I know where to begin. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I, I, see yeah. A lot, I see a lot of people carrying balances on credit cards. Um, and I really, that just freaks me out because the interest rate is so high. Um, so I've had some clients when looking at their, their balance sheet or what they own and what they owe and seeing that they have a balance on a credit card, um, but they have a few thousand dollars in cash that's sitting away in a savings account. Um, and they'll say, you know, what's that money for? Oh, well, you know, my grandmother gave it to me and I just, I feel really bad using it to pay off my credit card. It's like, well, let's do the math to see how much carrying this balance is going to cost you. And I feel like your grandmother would actually really like if you didn't throw that money away in interest, <laughs> right? So sometimes we do this mental accounting of like leaving something here, but we still have a debt there. Um, so I think that's a really big mistake, but also, if I back it up, even bigger mistake than that is not asking questions, mm -hmm. not seeking out advice, mm -hmm. and thinking, I don't earn enough money to go get advice, and I'll wait till I'm earning more money, and then all of these problems will go away. Because mm -hmm. um, that's really not the case. Our money is an amplifier for our habits, right? So if you don't have those good habits right now, having more money will just amplify the bad habits that you're you know, developing right now. Exactly. And it doesn't really, like, I, I understand that because when, when I was in my early 20s, yeah, I thought I couldn't afford to do a lot of things. Like, I, I don't think I could afford a financial advisor. I, I don't think I can afford to start investing. Uh, I'll wait until I'm, you know, have a little bit more money in the bank. But really, I mean, there's a lot of things you could just do on your own. You can start, I mean, coming to events like this and educating yourself, start reading books, blogs, lots of these things are free. And that's a good way to start a good foundation. And then as you do, you know, get raises and start saving more money and have more money, um, then you'll realize, oh, wow, I'm so glad that I, I started when I thought I couldn't afford it. Just like you said. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what do you think about managing your, um, like a low interest debt and also saving for retirement? This is a question I think I get a lot too is, um, yeah, what do I do? Should I just focus on debt or, but I also want to start investing because I know it's important to start, you know, as early as possible. What do I do? Define low interest. Uh, like prime. Prime? Like yeah. Um, I, I think it's important to start saving as soon as possible. So, yeah, we weren't really mm -hmm. going to get into this idea, but I think I it's an interesting concept to perhaps just present to people. Yeah. Um, and thinking about, again, it comes back to there's the logical brain one and then there's the heart-centered one. But from a math perspective, if you can invest money and have it accumulate interest or income at a higher rate than your debt is costing you, then financially that makes sense to do it, right? So I would say if you're paying something at prime and you have the opportunity to invest, you know, save and invest for the future, I would balance those two things. But I would do it in the context of knowing very specifically what your long-term goal is um, and how, how that interest that you're paying is going to affect your progress towards that goal, right? So you really do need to have a long-term plan to balance those decisions against each other. But then again, if that's a low interest debt that's causing you a lot of anxiety, um, because some, some folks, I think, just really want to be debt-free, no yeah. matter what the interest rate is, even if it's a loan you know, yeah. from our parents at zero yeah. interest. If that bugs you, then I think you should prioritize getting rid of that because mm -hmm. having bad feelings around money in general is going to hold you back from real financial success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the thing that kind of sometimes irritates me is when I'm like, you know, reading a financial book or a blog, there's lots of um, kind of, you know, uh, oh, this is general rule of thumb, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, you know, for instance, like I kind of mentioned, you know, general rule of thumb for debt repayment is, you know, tack the one that's charging you the most interest. But that sometimes that just literally may not work for you. And I feel like we need to kind of get rid of the idea that there's a one size fits all. Like you need to just see what are the different methods of debt repayment or saving or investing or whatever, uh, what makes sense most to me and how I feel. And that's why I, I loved having you because you do talk a lot about like we need to talk more about like the mental aspect of money and the emotional side because money is very emotional it's not dollars and cents like we have these emotional attachments to them and, and sometimes we can't even explain where they came from yeah 100 percent. yeah yes yeah oh yeah we didn't even touch credit scores yeah, yeah. credit scores where should we start um okay here's here, i mean oh, okay okay yeah, where should we start with credit scores? What's the, I guess my question to you is, what should people 
like, should people really care about them? Why are they important? The thing with me is I think a lot of people think, oh yeah, credit scores is, is super important. The important thing for credit scores you really only need to care about it is if you do want to borrow. If you have no plans in the future to ever borrow money, then your credit score isn't that important. But let's be honest, most of us probably will borrow money for maybe a car loan or a mortgage. So that is why it is really important. So I guess, what are some strategies for people to make sure that they have a, a good credit score, a healthy one? Well, I think first you need to know what it is. Yes, what's and a credit find... score? Should we talk about what a credit score is? Yeah, well, I, think <laughs> I, find, I mean, like, actually know what your yeah. number is. Yes. Because I, yes. I've had um, some clients call me um, and they'll say, I'm really worried about my credit score. It's awful. And I'll say, okay, well, what is it? Mm. I don't know. I haven't checked because I'm so horrified. Just this guy at the bank told me it was bad and that's why I couldn't get a loan. Mm. Say, well, the first step to solving this problem yes. is knowledge. And yes. let's go look at what that scary number is. And you know, maybe it's not as bad as you think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also a difference between a credit score and a credit report. Yes. So a credit score is just a number uh, and it puts you on a scale of how credit worthy you are, how likely you are to pay back your debt. And it, like you said, it, if you have a good credit score, it gives you access to debt, access to credit, possibly at a better interest rate than somebody with a low yeah. credit score. Um, but just knowing the number in and of itself isn't enough to help you make it better. You also need a copy of your credit report. Mm -hmm. And the report is what lists out all of the things that are driving your credit score. So what are the credit accounts that you have? Um, and if there are any problems, maybe any missed payments or delinquent accounts, they're going to show up on that report. Mm -hmm. And I have heard of cases where there's mistakes on the credit report. Yes. So you have a bad score, not because of anything you've done, but because of something like that can be fixed with a simple phone call. Exactly. Um, so I think... Those are the first really two, mm -hmm. the first very important two steps that you need to take Absolutely. is look at the score. The score you can get for free. The report you'll need to pay somewhere from $20 to $30 yeah. to get a copy of it. But I think that's oh, really... No, no, no. The report you can get for free, the score sometimes you have to pay. Hmm. You can get the report for free through um, Equifax or TransUnion. There's kind of an old school way of doing it. You have to mail them something. <laughs> I did mine online. <laughs> huh? I did mine online. Oh, you did? Oh, maybe yeah. they changed things. Maybe I should, it's been a while since I checked mine. Um, you can mail it, but uh, apparently you can do it online, which is awesome. Your credit score, um, you can pay it to get it for, I think it was $30 or $40 through Equifax or TransUnion. Those are the two credit bureaus in Canada. Um, but I know there's also a few um, financial companies that have paired with one of the credit bureaus. And so you, I think you just like sign up to their mailing list and then you can get your credit score for free, but then you're on their mailing list. So just so you know, they're going to promote whatever they want to promote to you. <laughs> yeah. So you want to start there if you're looking to improve it. And then you want to make sure that on whatever debts you have, you're making regular payments. The worst thing to do is to miss a payment. So even if you can't make the full one, like pay whatever you can or call ahead to let the, the company know and make alternate arrangements. Because looking like you don't care or like you've like flaked on it Absolutely. like I did after university, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the worst thing that you can do. Absolutely. Did you have a specific question yeah, was there about, a specific about that? Or? I know, we never got to it and I forgot. I was so excited too. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah. What are the benefits of having a financial advisor? That's such a good question. Yeah. I think first we have to define what is a financial advisor because mm -hmm. there's a lot of different kinds of financial advisors. So. Yeah. In Canada, outside of Quebec, the, the term financial planner is not regulated. So anyone can call themselves a financial planner. Um, and that can be really mm -hmm. confusing because there are some people who provide financial plans, which would be looking at your cash flow and helping you crunch the numbers to say, if you have this goal for retirement or for buying a house, like how do we turn that goal into a dollar amount and then back into how much you need to be saving? Like there's that very um, tactical kind of planning that, that you can get. Um, there are other advisors who sell products, who are selling investment products, for example. Um, so they might help you put together a retirement plan. Um, I don't know if the plan would specifically include like how much you would need to be putting into it every month or, um, or how you're going to afford that payment. Um, but they'll show you your money can grow by this much over this amount of time and recommend investment products for you. Mm -hmm. um, so first, it's understanding the kind of help that you need. Are you in a position where you need like really hands-on sort of coaching? That's the kind of work that I do as a financial planner. I sometimes call mm -hmm. myself a coach. I don't know if I love that word, but like I think it better describes yeah, yeah. what I do. Um, 
if you're that's more about like educating and helping them through kind of those foundational things. That exactly, you exactly. Um, but investment advisors are great as well because they can help you make really smart investing decisions. And in fact, I think even more than that, they can help you avoid making really stupid ones mm-hmm. um, because investing can be a real emotional roller coaster, yes. right? We can yeah. see the stock market go up and down and our instinct when things are crashing is to take our money out of our investments because cash feels safer. Mm-hmm. And then when we see things are moving back up, okay, now it's a safe time to invest. That's actually the worst thing you can do and could mm-hmm. be like the thing that holds you back from reaching your eventual retirement goals. And a financial advisor will be there or an investment advisor will be there holding your hand saying, now is not the time to sell. Exactly. Uh, or now is the time to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think there's, there's an educational benefit uh, of teaching you, you know, the basic principles of managing money and explaining it to you in a way that's approachable. Um, and then there's also helping guide your decisions and your behaviors to make sure that you're not making those decisions based on your emotions. Mm-hmm. And so w- one kind of uh, tip I always, or well, something that I learned early on when I was uh, discovering personal finance was if you're not sure if it's a financial planner or advisor or who this person is, just ask what their credentials are. It's like, are you a certified financial planner? Are you a CPA? What does that stand for? Uh, are you just a financial planner? Are you a fiduciary? Asking these questions. Also asking, how are you compensated? Uh, are you paid a salary? Are you on commission? Um, are you trying to sell me products and you get a commission on that? I just want to kind of understand how you're compensated so I can understand where you're coming from. And I want to throw out a book recommendation here. Ooh. I never thought that yeah. I would love the Tony Robbins book, Unshakable. Oh, and I actually, love Tony. I avoided love reading it for years because <laughs> I thought, I love Tony as like a motivational speaker and talking about behavior, yeah. but what the heck does he know about finance? Yeah. <laughs> and then I bought his audio book and he blew my mind. Yeah, he so does that, doesn't he? for anyone who wants to know about, it's, it's based on information in the States, which isn't exactly the same as Canada, but a lot of the principles are the same. Um, he and talks, he said in his book, it's not him just giving advice. He talks to this experts is the other thing. in his Yeah, book. he right. spent seven years researching this book by talking to all of the top, like the most mm-hmm. successful investment advisors, the people in the financial industry, uh, and he distilled all of their knowledge into this book. Um, so I bought the audio version of it. I listened to it over a weekend. Oh. Uh, I just like could not stop. I thought it was amazing. And oh. I think I've re- listened to or read almost all of the personal finance books out there. Mm-hmm. And I still found his to be really compelling. Um, mm-hmm. So in particular, if you're interested in investing and in understanding the stock market, understanding how the financial industry operates, I highly yeah. recommend reading that book. I just, I loved it. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Any other questions? All right. In the front row. Yeah. Yeah. So the kind of question is, you know, when you see your friends, you like spending their money, YOLOing it up, experiencing life, spending their money on their credit card, but you want to be a little bit more financially savvy because you have some financial goals you want to reach. How do you balance that? How do you, you know, not be a hermit and maintain a social life, but also not spend all of your money or get into debt? I mean, I'll be honest. I think I was a hermit for lots of my twenties, <laughs> though. I also had a lot of friends. I mean, I have a film school background so I lost my friends for starving artists so we are like hey do you want to bring a six pack over like that's kind of what we did but it's you know for me a lot of tough conversations of saying I can't afford it right now or I'm sorry I'm gonna have to I, I, I won't be able to join you this time but maybe next time how about yourself yeah I actually was not very good at that. Um, When I first started working, my first job was on Bay Street and I had a pretty decent salary and I lived at home and I had very minimal student debt. Um, But after like a year and a half or two years of working, I had made like very small dents in that debt and I had no savings because I spent everything that I earned Mm. because I was living it up. I mean, part of it was I was working really long hours. So I also felt like I was justified. Yeah, you're like, I I deserve this. I deserve these fancy clothes because I have fancy clients and I'm this and that. So I feel like I'm not the best person to advise (laughs) on that because when I was living it, I was making those mistakes. Um, But what I've learned being older is that a lot of people are in the same boat as you Mm -hmm. or 
even if they look like they can afford it, they can't really. Mm -hmm. And being the person that has the courage to start that conversation, um, they can be really grateful for that, for you also giving them permission to not have to, I don't want to say lie, but, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe pretend like things are better for them than they are. Um, So I found, for me, travel is really important. Mm -hmm. I love traveling, but going out to, like going out on the town um, is not as important. So Mm -hmm. I tend to not join in so much on, Um, like restaurant nights. Mm -hmm. Um, I prefer to have, we call it friends night where we get together for dinner at somebody's house. Um, So I think, I think suggesting alternatives too uh, is really helpful of not just saying like, no, I'm not going to go, but like, Hey, why don't we do this instead? Totally. Cause yeah, if it is experiences it's you know, you can put the focus back. It's like, I want to spend time with you, but I can't afford to do that activity. Um, So can we do, yeah. And just think of a list of different free, you know, activities. I mean, you know, a prime example is I had a friend in town and uh, I'm like, so can we just like go to the bakery, get a bunch of baked goods and watch Great British Bake Off? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, we can. <laughs> and it was awesome because we spent quality time together. And that cost us like $10, $15 at the bakery. Yeah. I think it's important too, though, to save up for a few special occasions. Of course, and not, yeah. Not yeah. say no always. Yeah, of course. Balance. It's all about yes. balance. Money, life, balance. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Um, how do you save at the same time and stay at the same time and stay at the same time and stay at the same time? Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, so how do you... Cash flow planning. Yeah, so... Cash the, flow planning. The question was, sorry, sorry, just in case, you know, uh, no one heard that, is how do you manage your credit card debt and also save? Yeah, it's so important to understand and to be able to project your cash flow or your cash needs in the next few months. Because I see a lot of people running into this problem of trying to pay off their debt so quickly, then running out of money and needing to put it back on their credit card to fund their life. And so um, the best way that I've discovered to do this is I see there's an app you can use called You Need a Budget, uh, which helps you you budget using the money that you have. So, you know, I said earlier, like spend what you have. That's what this app is all about. It says, how much money do you have in your bank right now and give it a job? So what does this money have to do for you? Um, So that you're not tempted to spend it because you've already allocated it. So that app is really helpful. I've also personally designed a spreadsheet for my clients. I work with a lot of freelancers that are in a a similar position. Um, And this spreadsheet I think is pretty magical because it projects your bank balance and your credit card balance for an entire year. Um, so you fill out how much you're earning and what your your spending needs are. And so you can see when you're going to run out of money. Mm-hmm. And having a like a really clear understanding of, of the flows, the ins and outs, and when you're going to run into the negative, I think is just critical to being yeah. able to manage uh, balancing those two priorities. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll take one more question. Yes. Yeah. All right, so question is, if you're a freelancer, how do you kind of do the same thing, manage saving and paying down debt? It's kind of the same answer. Like, try You Need a Budget. I think it's a, a fabulous application. Or call me and you can get my spreadsheet and I can show you how to use it. Um, trying to manage those two. With, I think also something that I like to do with my income mm-hmm. is using percentages. Mm -hmm. So instead of setting a savings goal that this month I'm going to save $100, I say for every payment that I receive from a client, a certain percent goes into my savings account, a certain percent goes into my business expense account, and another percent goes into my personal spending account. Um, So that way, no matter how big or small the payment, I'm always allocating a portion to the different needs in my life. And it just makes that decision. It eliminates the need to make a decision. Um, so it makes it much easier to make sure that there's money in each of those pots. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually do it by having one account where all the payments go in. Mm-hmm. And then twice a month, I allocate it out across those different accounts um, based mm-hmm. on those percentages. And there's a book. It's called Profit First by Michael Michalowicz. Um, I read that book. And I decided to, instead of just reading it, to actually implement it. And I could say it's really been a game changer for me. Awesome. Um, So I'm starting to help my clients implement it too. So I would say check that out. Awesome. Two good book recommendations. All right. 
Last call for questions. It was 8.30. Damn, we can talk. Um, all right. If you still have any questions, uh, we're going to wrap this up, and you can grab us one-on-one -on -one to ask your questions privately. Um, there's also a uh, money question box right near the gift bags over there, so if you really don't want to even talk to us but still have a question, you can fill out your question, put it in there, and I'm definitely going to kind of compile them, and maybe me and Lisa can kind of do like a follow-up or something. That'd be really fun. That would be so, be so fun. fun. Yeah. Let's do it. So please, put some <laughs> questions in there. Yes. Um, okay, and so, like I mentioned, the challenge for you now, we've got uh, another hour to just hang out, mix and mingle. You don't have to run away uh, if you want to grab another drink um, and have some fun with us. But there's also uh, some of those money question uh, buckets, and I'm going to be walking around and, um, you know, starting some money conversations with you, which is the whole point of all of this. So um, a big thank you for all of you for showing up today. A big, big thank you for Manulife Bank for sponsoring this Millennial Money Meetup for Financial Literacy Month. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again. And I will, uh, you know, catch us catch us on the fly. I don't know. Anyways, uh, there's also some gift bags. So if you do have to head out, make sure to grab some. There's some really great goodies in there that I want to get you in. So thank you again. Also, thank you, Lisa, for being our awesome special guest. Aw, thank Ooh. you, Jessica. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, live recording with me and Lisa Zamparo. Make sure to check her out uh, at lisazamparo.com. Of course, I'm going to include links in the description, so make sure to check that out. And of course, of course, I will be doing more Millennial Money Meetups in the future, but if you want to make sure you don't miss any, that is why you need to get onto my mailing list. Go to jessicamorehouse.com slash subscribe, and you will get right on there, and I will let you know when I do my next one, which will be awesome. Uh, also, another big thank you to Manulife Bank for sponsoring this event. We couldn't have done it without you. I really, really appreciate it. Now, before you go, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, I have a lot of interesting things coming up on the channel, so I don't want you to miss a thing, and I would really appreciate you to subscribe. And also, if you like this video, make sure to like or comment. I uh, answer every single comment I get. Uh, but thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time.